Welcome to Annenberg. I'm Diane Winston. I'm on the faculty here, and I also hold the knight, as in knight of shining armor, the knight chair in media and religion. And this story, stories of this story, this ex exhibition, stories of social change, spirituality, in action, is very dear to my heart. Our curators, Noel and Magdalena Rojo, who were also journalists who participated in the project, described it best. I tinkered with their words a little bit, so Magdalena and Noel, please don't um, be upset, but I think I did capture your vision. Our goal was to craft a narrative that centers around the disclosure of spirituality and its potential as a driving force behind social change. We were surprised by two things. First, the number of people worldwide making significant changes in their society. And I want to editorialize here. Would that journalism told more of those stories? Second, the difficulty of finding information about the spirituality of those who we wish to cover. Many exemplary individuals do not explicitly discuss their faith. And since it is such an integral part of their daily lives, their faith often goes unnoticed. That's why this exhibition begins by highlighting the visible aspects of spirituality and ends by exploring its hidden dimensions. Thank you, Magdalena and Noel. So before our official start, I want to acknowledge the staff at the USC Cent Dornsife Center for Religion and Civic Culture. They organized the project, guided it through the pandemic, and midwifed this exhibition. I'm hoping that you all can stand up for a second so we can applaud you. One of the key members of this team, someone who wrote six profiles and edited much of the copy you read tonight, is missing. Nick Shindo Street, beloved student, friend, and colleague, passed away last week. His unexpected death was tragic and heartbreaking. But Nick's spirit, honed by his commitment to Buddhism and his love for words, imbues this entire event. So let's begin with the mastermind. This project is the brainchild of Donald E. Miller, the Leonard K. Firestone Professor of Religion at USC and the co-director, co-founder rather, and the Director of Strategic Initiatives at the Center for Religion and Civic Culture. He also is the project's principal investigator. In my opinion, and this is not to overlook Don's many, many achievements, this project, the photos, the videos, the audio, the sociological findings, and this exhibition is easily the capstone of Professor Miller's more than 50-year career here at USC. So, Professor Miller, I will cede the stage to you so you can tell us about your baby. What uh, Diane did not say is that in October I am retiring for the second time. <laughs> So every project has a story and a backstory, and I want to just take four or five minutes and tell you what that is, and then we will turn to our panelists, and I'll turn it back to Diane. Uh, during my 50 years, I've had the privilege of doing a lot of international travel, and every once in a while, I would encounter an incredible, exceptional person. 
And these were individuals involved in humanitarian work of all different kinds. Uh, we have the band playing here for us <laughs> in the background. Well, they deserved to play after 50-0 uh, in the first half last week, if you watch that. Um, so I had this uh, sort of crazy idea. This was now probably six and a half years ago that uh, wouldn't it be fascinating to do a project in which there would be profiles of 100 individuals these exceptional characters involved in humanitarian work all over the globe. The question was, how could you possibly pull off such a project? So I took this idea to the John Templeton Foundation, and uh, they bit on the idea of a three-year project. So we uh, sent out a call to global journalists, and we only wanted a dozen. We had 350 applications, literally from all over the world. And so finally, it was heartbreaking. We finally took about two dozen of them, and then we added a few more along the way. Uh, Part of what we asked them to do was suggest uh, an exemplary person that they had read about or had encountered in their own journalism and uh, propose that as someone that they would want to profile. Uh, we also went to work ourselves and eventually created a database of about 450 such people, again, all over the world. And so uh, as we launched the project, we of course had a meeting with all of these journalists. We brought them to USC. We talked to them about our goal. Uh, and very explicitly, we were not making a comparison between secular humanitarians and religious humanitarians. Instead, we were just going to focus on people who were inspired in one way or another by their religious values and who were sustained in the difficult work that they were doing by their own spiritual practices. Uh, we also thought, as long as we're doing a, a very unwieldy project, in addition to these print journalists, we would also involve people who were radio journalists or who did podcast. And so, uh, we enlisted a P, uh, PBS station up in San Francisco, KALW. Um, we also enlisted um, a videographer, uh, Kim Lawton, and we were set to go. Uh, we launched the project, and then, of course, what happened? COVID. Uh, we were paying the airfare of these journalists to travel anywhere in the world they wanted, as well as a stipend for their work. Fortunately, the foundation funding this said, we'll give you a two-year extension. So I'm very proud to report, since this project ends in October, when I end here at USC, <laughs> we uh, met our goal of 104, uh, exemplary human beings involved in humanitarian work. The journalist published 115 articles in everything from Al Jazeera to The Guardian to The New York Times to um, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, various online publications. We had 18 in-depth podcasts. And I know you've seen the photographs or will soon, but you really ought to go listen to some of those podcasts. They won all sorts of awards. The project ended up with 11 videos, and we have four books in process. Unfortunately, one of those is a book I need to write. Um, but uh, I'll get around to that at some point. Now. Uh, right from the get-go, we wanted this to be a highly pluralistic project. 
we're very pleased we had 13 different faith traditions represented among our 104 exemplary human beings in 42 different countries. Um, amazing. You know, that didn't fit any of the normal standards of social science research, you know, with controlled populations and comparisons and so forth. Um, we also, however, sort of lucked out, I think, we had almost an equal distribution of women and men. We actually had a few more women than men. And we had quite a range uh, in terms of age. We thought, you know, maybe these would all be old folks. Not the case. Now, um, let me just say a little bit about uh, this exhibit and um, then I'm going to turn it back uh, to Diane. So I guess at the heart of uh, this exhibit and the whole project is the idea that um, moralizing to people really doesn't work. I interviewed Father Greg, for example, and I know from interviewing Greg and a bunch of the homies, you know, you can't tell people to do this, that, or the other thing. Instead, what people are searching for is some sort of thread, a pathway to purpose and to meaning. And that was true of every one of the exemplars that uh, were interviewed. They didn't go after happiness particularly, they went after joy. And joy is a long-term thing, and uh, you may go through a lot of struggles and a lot of challenges, uh, but at the end, uh, it's joy, not happiness, that drive these people. Uh, these individuals are <laughs> exceptional and to make a huge generalization. They're people of courage, they take risk, they have a lot of grit, uh, and yet at the same time, uh, they're individuals whose lives are punctuated on a daily basis by prayer, by meditation, and other spiritual practices. So I want to turn it back to Diane, who's going to have a conversation with three of these individuals that were part of our project. Thank you very much. Father Musay Zerai, his phone rings, and it happens to be people on a plastic dinghy in the middle of the Mediterranean. He thought it was a crank call, quickly realized it wasn't when he heard their screaming and crying for help. He connected with the Coast Guard and all 300 were rescued. He later learned that his phone number was actually written on the walls of a Libyan detention center as someone to call in case of emergency. And his number is still there, along with dozens of testimonials about the number of lives he saved. Faith is this fire hose for Father Zarai, keeping him going in the face of insurmountable crisis and trauma. Dr. Donald Miller and his team at the University of Southern California asked dozens of journalists to profile highly regarded people whose faith and spiritual practices fuel their humanitarian work. These 104 spiritual exemplars represent 42 different countries, places as diverse as the United States, Guatemala, Indonesia, and Israel. We really wanted them to be representative of the global population, both in geography and in global religious demographics. So Christians at roughly 30%, Muslims at roughly 24%, unaffiliated and Hindus at roughly 15 to 16%. And I would say we got very close to both our geographic spread and our demographic goals for religious adherence, though the pandemic made it a little bit challenging. Often the narrative about religion that we hear, that gets clicks, that sells papers, is usually about bad religion. There are reasons to see the shadow side of religious institutions and individuals who claim to speak for God. But the flip side is that there are also individuals addressing issues of justice, equity, poverty, climate change, 
and so it was an opportunity to tell a different kind of story about religion around the world. The journalists chosen for the project came away with exceptional stories about exceptional people, people whose work is rooted in their spirituality. They are kind of driven to do the work that they do because of a certain calling. But in that calling itself, there is some strong element of spirituality. These individuals are very non-materialistic. They have a purpose in life to live for others rather than themselves. They tend to be characterized by having a deep empathy, identifying with the pain and suffering of others. In Tunisia, this person called Badar Babu, he wanted to explore the possibility of finding safe spaces for the LGBTQ community and they've told him that they're going to burn him down, put him into prison. But Badar has been able to create several safe spaces in Tunisia and outside of Tunisia as well. I ended up actually profiling for women, and in our world, it's most often women who are doing some of the most impactful work as religious actors in the humanitarian sphere, whatever issue that might be. To date, the 100 Exemplar Stories Project has produced videos and articles that have appeared in media outlets ranging from the New York Times to Al Jazeera, the Christian Science Monitor, and the Harvard Divinity Bulletin. The impact is being felt not just by those who read and hear these stories, but also by the journalists who wrote them. It was very beautiful to experience people within their cultures and within their spiritual beliefs in different parts of the world. I don't see things as black and white anymore, but there's like all other colors that they can have. Here are these people who are kind of unseen and yet they're changing so many lives out there. Some, like in the case of Twin Jaiteeds, hundreds of thousands of lives are getting their citizenships in mm -hmm. Thailand, where for generations they were stateless. I went to Plum Village to look at the monastic community there, and one of their requirements is to come in and actually be a part of the retreat, experience what life is like there. I did that three months before the pandemic, then three months before I got a cancer diagnosis. I saw how spiritual practices such as mindfulness can help us through personal and societal crises. My career has been split between studying genocide and projects that that have hope involved in them. This project has been filled with joy. It's not just about what you believe, it's about what you feel related to compassion, empathy for others. The project really has challenged me personally, and in talking to a number of the journalists, they have told me the same thing. What a great video, and thank you, Don. That was a good explanation of your brainchild. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists today, and I'm going to do um, very little justice to their long and um, glorious careers. Father Greg Boyle is the founder of Homeboy Inc., the largest gang intervention and prison reentry program in the world. <laughs> During his 50 years as a Jesuit priest, he has witnessed many gang deaths and many missed opportunities, but he has also seen so many lives made whole through his ministry. Sabrina Sojourner is a Shalik Sabor, a Jewish spiritual leader, community chaplain, educator, word artist, and facilitators of conversations on diversity, equity, justice, inclusion, and the future of democracy and Judaism. A lifelong activist for women, gays, and people of color, her work focuses nowadays on racial and religious tolerance. Brother Fab Young, a former architect, was ordained a monastic leader under Thich Nhat Hanh. Brother Young is committed to building modern day communities of resistance to answer the challenges of modern urban society. 
He offers mindfulness programs for people of all ages and works to heal the earth. And he's also a Trojan. <laughs> okay, would the three of you come up and join me? I will be asking some questions, and then I'm going to open it up to you all, because I'm sure you have a lot of things you'd like to ask these folks. So you all have been doing this work for at least 20 years, and many of you have been doing it a lot longer. The work you do is hard, frustrating, and challenging. What gets you up in the morning, and what keeps you going? Start with a simple question, right? <laughs> Um, it's changed over the years. I, I think initially I was operating from a place of lack, and that changed over time to abundance. While, we hear, while the news focuses on all the things that are wrong in the world, I know that when I open my eyes and, not just, and look at my communities and the communities around there, there's so much wonderful things, so many wonderful things going on. And certainly technology, if there's any way in which it's a blessing, there are more ways in which all of us can be connected and know about one another, even if we don't get the chance to meet each other, and except in uh, exceptional per circumstances. And so I think that that's, knowing I'm not doing it alone, I'm not the only one, feeling less isolated has really transformed how I do this work and my ability to sustain myself. Thank you. Um, Coffee, I think, is what uh, <laughs> what gets me up in the morning. But no, I, I, you want to tr try to say anchored in uh, the kind of the ground of your own being, and then so that you can receive the tender glance, uh, and then you can choose to become the tender glance. And and so, uh, like this morning, going into our headquarters in Chinatown. Uh, you know, I've been gone for a couple of days, and so people are, are, I'm just astounded by the courage of their own tenderness and how they, you know, hold you and are cariñoso, and they're always, uh, you know, really anchored in gratitude. So it, it invites me always to uh, receive who they are, allow my heart to be altered by them every day. And... Uh, and then you're anchored in the present moment as well, which is the only way, uh, you know, uh, to stay grounded. You know, so it's it's not so much a, a place that you you uh, land on, but it's kind of an ocean you float in, you know, and you kind of try to stay attentive to who who's right in front of you. And so, even though there's so many right in front of you, so it's hard uh, to remember. To, to cherish the person who's right there. But that's kind of what keeps me going. Okay. I agree, we should be applauding after every one of these <laughs> gems of wisdom, but we won't get through much if we do. So let's hold the applause until we're done and then we can give them a standing ovation. <laughs> Would you like to mm. answer? Yeah, for me, I, I live in a community. Our monastery is set up as a you know, we have monks, nuns, we have lay friends. So it's, um, when we do anything, it's a, it's a community. So there's accountability. You're, so everything you do is very linked to everyone else. So waking up in the morning, you know, everyone is waking up and going to meditation. And you do that too. So you, you're supported by not just your own will, but like the will of the collective. And like we have retreats coming up. And we all have responsibility. We have two retreats coming up. And it's like, you know, we know what each of our role is. Some people are cleaning. Some people are buying vegetables. Some people are, like, setting up tables. So I think our answer is that we don't do it individually. So for me, that really uh, fuels me. Personally, uh, I come in touch with uh, suffering. I, I, I keep myself updated what young people going through the suicidal rates, the depression, the addiction to uh, 
So actually suffering and knowing what is out there, what's going on in other places on the planet, what's happening to the planet. Mm, so in touch with suffering motivates me because I see what we do helps, helps people and it helps activists. It helps uh, all kinds of people who come for refuge and, and they get to go and do and help relie uh, relieve those suffering places. So that motivates me to know that there are a lot of people who want to do good, but they just also need to know how to take care of themselves. So that's, uh, that what, that's what wakes me up. <laughs> so you never get up and say, oh shit, I can't stand another day like this. <laughs> I'm just doing a reality check. <laughs> that's right, right, right. Um, okay. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> That's right. There you go. <laughs> okay. I'm the only person who has trouble getting up in the morning, I see. <laughs> so uh, what is your earliest memory connecting you to the work you do and the spiritual commitment you feel? Like You did not come out of the womb, I suppose, knowing that this was going to be your life path. So what sort of led you to it? Well, for, for, for me, you know, because I was a pastor of a very poor parish, and, and so gangs kind of weren't on my radar, even growing up in L.A., and even when I was at Dolores Mission in the early days, immigration was kind of the issue, the thing people were, separation of families and all sorts of things, and, you know, uh, raids and all sorts of things at factories where our parishioners uh, were impacted by that. And then I started to bury kids in 1988. And then I started to bury lots of kids. And so, and once I, I, there was a period of, uh, where I buried eight kids in a three week period, all from in my parish. So that kind of woke me up to kind of what this was and what it was becoming. And then it just the beginning of a decade of death. So, but I never set out to do anything. So, but you're there and you're responding to whatever is in front of you, whether it was immigration issues or the fact that kids were, were dying a lot. So, so we try to get underneath it rather than just uh, demonize perpetrators. And so that, that didn't, you know, uh, was not some magical thing, but it was how, how do you listen to people? How do you receive people? And how do you uh, somehow just be helpful to alleviate suffering, you know, uh, as best you can, you know. And um, when did you realize you had a calling to the, pre the ministry? Oh, well, I, you know, I, I was called to be a Jesuit, you know, like the Pope. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying, but <laughs> but I was kind of a Jesuit first, you know, and and then a priest later, but uh, so but I, I liked the charism of Saint Ignatius, and I and I loved the Jesuits who educated me, and I always found them joyful and uh, prophetic, and so I, I was drawn to those two uh, things. Thank you. Um, for me. Uh I grew up, my family grew up Buddhist. Uh, we would go to temple every Sunday. And, you know, they do their thing, and I'm sitting in the back. And this is like, what, I'm 10, 12, 14. And so throughout my childhood, I grew up with Buddhism. And, and but I didn't understand any of it. It's kind of like, what do they say, Sunday church? You go to Sunday church, and you go home, and you do your thing? Where, you know, Vietnamese, they go to the temples and they go home and they still throw plates around, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so my experience of Buddhism, uh, I didn't really uh, connect. But then uh, my first retreat, I wanted to meet Vietnamese people. I grew up in an area where there were not many Vietnamese people, so I grew up with Americans. And the first retreat, I wanted to meet Vietnamese people. Actually, I was preparing to uh, go to... Uh, back to Vietnam, and I wanted to meet some Vietnamese people before I go to Vietnam. Actually, it's from a scholarship from the architecture school. 
they sent me to Vietnam to study architecture. <laughs> I just made some stuff up and they, uh, they paid for it. <laughs> it's just an excuse to go back to my homeland. Uh, but that was in that retreat, it was my first time seeing uh, Buddhist meditation and, and seeing nice Vietnamese people. I was like, wow, they're so gentle and they don't speak so loud. And you know, my mind, uh, through the, the schedule of the retreat, I started to see a lot what my mind was thinking. So that had a, a different effect. I was there to meet Vietnamese people, but I also met my own kind of anger towards my father. And I realized that during that retreat. And when I went back home, I started meditating more. I began to see the, the thinking, the anger that came up when I would hear my father, and all of a sudden, I would have this reaction. As a young man, that's the first time where I actually sat and didn't do anything about it. Normally, if I'm moving around, I would slam the door and let him know that, you know, <laughs> that's how we communicate. And so this is the first time I'm sitting in the uh, room seeing my anger and actually not doing anything. And I remember that experience. That was my first, uh, I don't know what you call it, but uh, uh, inspiration of like, wow, I'm so glad I didn't go out of the, we have an auto room. And I felt so happy that I didn't go out of there and did, did something, you know, slam the door or do something to, 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 to you know, aggressive towards my father. And I felt really happy. And so that was my first retreat. And then I went to, a, two years later, another retreat. And so I began to understand that it's our choice, you know, to, to do or not to do something. And, and the meditation helps you see that, it slows me down. Anyway, that's for me the entry into and what this is, is just full time. You know, I, I changed career from architecture and you know, this is what I do now. It's, uh, it's my career and uh, this is, I'm inspired to teach other people. It's like, hey, you, you get a choice, you know? If you recognize, you get to choose this path or that path. So for me, that was the happiness that I felt personally and I felt indebted to the whole culture, the whole whatever, religion, or through my teacher and many monks and so on. And then I get to meet the monks and nuns, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. They're like actually affecting real change. And so for me, that was the, uh, I, I, I wrote in a letter to uh, ask for being ordained is uh, uh, the, the, what I'm known for writing is uh, like from architecture as architect, I've been working for four years. Uh, creating space outside is one thing, but making people have space inside is actually crucial for them to enjoy outside space. So for me, I saw that link between architecture and internal space. So for me, that is my uh, inspiration now. And I see many people in our modern society, they actually lack that space. They're full of thinking, uh, notions, and perceptions, and they don't know how to take a break from that. So anyway, I don't want to take too long, but that's uh, my inspiration, why I dedicate uh, my life to teaching this method of how to actually uh, make space for oneself. And that is the foundation for love, compassion, kindness, peace, whatever that is, is the internal uh, space. The truth is that I really don't know how to answer that question because, uh, <clears throat> well, I can say I've always been a spiritual person. Um, my, uh, at one point in my life, I was very happily uh, a theist, just somebody who believed in the divine and participated in rituals and in ceremony that was personally meaningful for me with a group of people with, a, with whom I felt safe. And what I love about that time is I learned a lot about myself. I also learned a lot about uh, many different traditions. and. And then I, I, when I was teaching at San Francisco State, I was teaching this in uh, 
the Women's Studies Department, and there were several women I was working with who were Jewish, and we started talking about spirituality, and many of the things that they said but were meaningful to me, and I connected them to actually to my uh, Cherokee grandmother. Uh, and there's a longer story for that, but I'm not going to go into right now. But and and two of the things that I learned and taught from her, and so and a curiosity and even I would say a deep interest it developed, and and then one day it was just like there's no other place for me to go because uh, this is who I am. Uh, there, and and so I started studying. I started. Uh, doing all of these different things. I'm, I started leading services. I started uh, uh, learning Hebrew, not just to be able to mouth the prayers, but to understand the meaning of them. And here I am. At, I think that part of what is um, serves me is it feeds everything. It feel, feeds my art. It feels, feeds my spirituality. There, uh, I lo I've always loved meditating, and it, it, I can do that. And it actually has transformed how I am in the world. And by be transforming how I am and who I be in the world, I am transforming other people. Uh, there are so, okay, I'll focus. <laughs> Many people in this audience, I bet, would love to make a difference in the world, but they're not ready to give up their careers or their lives as they stand. Um, and so I think a lot of people may, f not talking about you, but there may be a lot of people who feel like, I, gee, I wish I could make a change, but I don't even know where to start. How can I, how can I what can I do? How can I make a difference? Um, do you have any thoughts for people like that who, feel like they want to do something, but just don't know where to begin? I mean, do they begin by meditating, and then they start doing something? Or do they get, begin by doing something, and then maybe that leads them into a, spirit, a deeper spiritual understanding? Like... Yes, I'm going to dare to take that on first. Um, the only way, well, I'm going to start with a, sh a sh short story. There was a young man who wanted to change the world. And so he graduated from college and went out to the world and started to change the world and ran into all sorts of problems and all sorts of issues. And so he decided instead of changing the world, he would just change the United States. And, he, uh, and then he ran into problems with that. And he said, well, maybe I should just look at my state. And he again ran into problems. And so he kept narrowing, and then including getting to the point of wanting to change his family. And of course, he first found resistance with that as well. It was only when he began to change himself said, and said, I'm just going to focus on me, that he realized that by changing who he was being into who he really wanted to be, he changed his family. And by changing his family, he changed his community. And by changing his community, it, it ripples on. And, that, and, it's, and that's really the key. A lot of the things that we're told in the society are that everything can be solved with an intellectual exercise. That is absolutely false. If we're not changing our, our basic way of being, if we're caught up in our fears, if we're caught up in our anxieties, if we're caught up in our, in our, our trauma, we're allowing those things to dictate what we do and don't do in the world. By incorporating and learning to live with our disappointments, with our trauma, with our joys, uh, with our successes, as well as with our failures, and for those things around us, we begin to be the person we really want to be in the world. Bec and part of that is also absolutely related to meditation, because we begin to watch our busy mind instead of letting our busy mind dictate who we are in the world. Mm. You know, in the monastery, we, we have retreats, and we get a lot of people who are doing activism. Journal we have retreats for journalists as well. 
And I see uh, there's a danger that you become a victim of a cause, an, a great cause, and you, because you want to achieve it so much that you actually forget the little things. You know, what is it we say, oh, I don't have time for that. Uh, oh, I don't have time for that. You know, like these things that, 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 that nourish you, they're so small, they're, but like you don't have time, and, oh, I can't do that anymore. You know, you, you know, I love surfing, but I can't do that anymore. You know, that my former boss, he doesn't surf anymore. He hangs his, I don't know why I should talk about this, but, <laughs> but like he, he, he makes an altar of his surfboard and I, I talk to him and I say, why don't you take the surfboard down and go surfing? You know, it's like, it's your choice. So there are little things that you do. So when they come to the monastery, they, they are part of a team. They learn how to peel the carrot. It's not about the meditation in the hall. But it's like we, we, they get on a, room, uh, a group, and they learn how to peel a carrot for the cooking team. They learn how to clean the pots. The, and people come and say, God, you, you organize them to do all your work. <laughs> they clean our toilets, you know? And we, had, we have all kinds of people from all kinds of background. They have to put in the rubber gloves and it's like, I have to do this. Yes, this is part of the meditation. And so they find joy in little things again. You won't believe the, the, the group that I had. We had to clean toilets. We had the most insight because <laughs> things that they did that they thought was dirty and so on became such joy. They, they made a song about it, and we went dancing around with, uh, what do you call it, new, clean, uh, what are those, uh, those things that you clean, yeah. Yeah, yeah they, we had to go buy new ones, because you don't want them to fling, you know, and we made a song and a dance about it. And so can you imagine a group of adults, successful, <laughs> wealthy adults, like doing songs, dancing about, and celebrating toilet cleaning. So what I want to share here is that the, uh, we become victims and we, we, we uh, take for granted the little joys, folding clothes, peeling an orange, enjoying a cup of water. Recently I saw, uh, sorry, I'm going on a tangent. I have to share this. I saw a little package of oranges pre-cut in a section for fast food. It's like in the fresh food, but you don't have to clean, you don't have to wash, and the orange was cut and the advertisement had a stick. Now you don't have to uh, inconvenient yourself by peeling and getting your hands dirty <laughs> or cleaning an orange. Can you believe that? It's an inconvenience to peel an orange because your hand will get dirty and to cut it up. That is, I, I saw that and it hurt. Because I used to buy stuff like that. And so this is something uh, we have to be very careful with in terms of what um, our culture, our, uh, what we, and some people who are doing good cause become victim to that. And that's why they burn out because they, uh, I don't know, some, it's, an under, it's like an undermine. You know, you, you want this big stuff because it's important, but then these little things, your children, your family, you sacrifice, even the little stuff how you wake up. So in the monastery, we tell them to let go of all that. And we get them to clean the toilets. We, take, we get them to just walk for walking sake and to sit and just to sit for, it's like useless, purposeless. You don't need to produce a good idea. You just sit and be unproductive. So these are some of the medicine that we're discovering that is uh, so needed to be useless, purposeless, waste, you know, and uh, wasting your time, you know? It's like, uh, uh, email me, email me, email me. You know, is uh, those things, once it's uh, uh, settled, and then that simple happiness, that will sustain them in their uh, work, yeah. Um, I, I, Donna and I have talked about this before because I think if, you know, you, uh, and I thank you for the distinction between happiness and joy. Because I think if I go to the margins to make a difference, then it's about me. But if I go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make me different, then it's about us. So 
and I think that's where burnout comes from. It comes from, you know, fixing, uh, rescuing, saving people. I was in Houston, I, I gave a talk, and afterwards this gang member came up to me, and he was working with gang members in Houston as a, a gang intervention uh, street worker. And he pleaded with me, and he said, how do, how do you reach them, meaning gang members? And, and I said, I found myself saying, well, for starters, stop trying to reach them. You know, can you be reached by them? Can you allow your heart to be altered by them? Because now that feels passive, like you're not having an impact, but I, I think it's the opposite is true. I think what happens is then you allow yourself uh, to receive the other person and to be reached by this person, and then together you are inhabiting your mutual dignity and nobility. And, and it's exquisitely mutual, as opposed to I'm going to transform your life right now, which is preposterous. So volunteers, we have like 300 at, at Homeboy, and you know they'll say, well, what am I gonna do here? And I always say, no, that's the wrong question. What's going to happen to you here? And then they get it, then they know that they just have to be, enter into a relational wholeness with people. Well, that's eternally replenishing. You're never going to, uh, be depleted by that. You're never going to burn out because you're delighting in the person in front of you. And whereas that feels passive, it's the opposite of it. It's how people inhabit their own unshakable goodness and they know, oh yeah, this is who I am. And, and thank you for, you know, for this moment that's mutual. And then everybody's lives are, are, filled with the utter fullness of, of dignity and, and goodness. So I, so I don't know. I, I think you learn that lesson the hard way, you know, by being, getting near to burnout. And then you realize, oh, this is where the joy is. Not, so don't settle for happiness when you could have joy, you know. Um, I have been hogging the questions, and I'm looking at my handlers to see if I can open it up to the audience for a few questions. Good. So, anyone have a question they want to ask? Yeah? Um, hi, I'm Cheryl. Thank you so much for being here. Could you share about what your individual, personal, like, spiritual struggle has been, um, like, the most intense moment where that dark night of the soul was like, I don't know if I can keep doing what I am doing. Can you share about how you, uh, what that was and how you got through it? I'm glad you asked that question because that was my next question. <laughs> You're obviously very intelligent. <laughs> I'm, I was giving you a little time to think. No, I actually I know exactly what it is. Um, it had to do with fixing. And the short story is once I identified that that is like a core thing I need to stop fixing, I, um, I, did, I wrote two letters. One was to the Perfectionist Society. It was a letter of resignation. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other one uh, was to the um, Big Sister Society, because I'm the oldest daughter of the oldest daughter. And I said, uh, I will only work, I'm changing my work role, and my, from this point forward, I'm only doing it in community, I'm not doing it alone. And by, and those two things, really living into them, like, sometimes the, it's the imperfection that allows something to really shine. And so being able to, and some people just actually need to be allowed to clean up their own mess. And so those are the two things that really transformed. The, uh, the third thing, which actually happened as I shared at lunch uh, more than 20 years ago, was, was uh, realizing that 
a lot of the things I get from other people about who I am and how I'm being say way more about them than it does about me. So I started learning to give it back to them uh, without necessarily making them wrong. They may feel wrong, <laughs> but, but I really try to be recognize their humanity and, and their, their whatever I think their intention was, but their, their racism, their sexism, their whatever it is, is not, my, is not for me to take on. So those are the things that I have done. Mm. For me, I, uh, it was a point, maybe third, fourth year of, of being a monk, I, uh, I went through a little depression. And the hardest thing is to accept that you're sad and you don't know why. And, you know, the mind wants to find reasons. And in reflection, now that I'm out of it, and the thing that helped me move through that was discipline. I would wake up earlier, four o'clock, and run to the church and did prostration, came back, took a cold shower. So mentally, spiritually, I was, uh, how you call it in the spiritual uh, tradition, they call it like, they have many names for it. It's like dark, dark space, wasteland. You know, in the Buddhist, they call it the, 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 the dark emptiness. And you read, I mean, everyone goes through that. And what I realized that uh, my habit of actually doing things for others was so ingrained, and it's, a, uh, it's from ancestor. And my mom has it, my dad has it, my dad's Chinese, my mom's Vietnamese. And so in reflection, I see that we have this, uh, uh, and I was trying to do that for my teacher and to my community. So you wanna be a good monk, you wanna look, you know, you're mindful, you're, you know, you do things and you don't realize it because it's underneath. You're doing it for others because you're afraid of something. But when you're sad and you're not, you don't know why, and you can't pretend that you're happy because it's like, ah. Oh. <laughs> and I would hide, you know, I would, uh, and it was so hard for me to accept that. But I think that was the most important uh, uh, kind of like, turning to really accept myself uh, crying. I cried in the, this bamboo grove that, in our monastery in Plum Village in France. I'll never forget that. I stayed there and it started raining. And I'll never forget, I was crying and it was raining and the bamboos were blowing in the, the, the wind was blowing it and I started smiling again. <laughs> because I felt like, because I squeezed myself in the bamboo and I felt, I felt like the bamboo was like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, like a mom, you know? Yeah, it was so beautiful. And uh, that was my, it, I smiled again as I was crying. And, and it was raining. You know, this is a, it was a moment that I uh, never forget. It was so cool because like you can be sad and you can be joyful at the same time. And that's for me what I finally uh, hold to this. Every, I remind myself all the time that those two don't conflict. You can have really dark moments. You can hold it. But w when you are, have that experience and you're aware of it and you don't lose yourself in that dark thought, that dark emotion, you can smile to it. And if you are patient, you can actually really smile to it. So those two things, I, I created a, a conflict in them. So for me, that was a moment I think uh, I brought more joy. And also my teacher knew. He, he pinched me on the nose like this because I was too serious, perfectionist. Uh, I was trying to be like a perfect monk 24 hours. It's not possible. And he turned around, he twitched my nose. And I was like, what'd you do that for? <laughs> But he knew I was lacking joy in my practice. I was just way too mindful. <laughs> you know, or how do you call it? You know, just too uh, intense. I was just like, I smell like a practitioner, what you call it. <laughs> and so for me, uh, I had to lighten up. So that was the uh, a moment. And, and now I can see it. 
I can see it. It's amazing when you go through that. And anyway, it's just an uh, inspiration, yeah. Um, I'm wondering who your handlers are, so I, I just... Uh, we have a little more time. Oh, we have time. Okay, so uh, for me, I've been working with gang members for 40 years, so it was somewhere in year 10 where I've never had an experience like this in my entire uh, 69 years of living. And at that point, I was uh, kind of like a crazy person. I was riding my bike in the middle of the night in the housing projects, you know, and put that Uzi down. Are you sure you want to shoot that guy? It was crazy. And I didn't sleep, and it was just kind of cuckoo bird, you know? And, and a, a long story short, a, a homie named Lulu, a gang member, his brother uh, killed himself, and, uh, and then he had this dream, and he told me about the dream. And in the dream, he and I were in a, in a dark room, no lights, no illuminated exit signs, no light creeping under the door, pit, pitch black. Just the two of us are in this room, which he seems to know, and we're not speaking, we're silent. And in the silence, I, I take a flashlight and I aim it at uh, the light switch on the wall, but I don't say any words, I just hold it steadily. And then he tells me the dream. He, he says in the dream he knows that he's the only one who can walk to the light switch and flip the light switch on. And so, and he says, and I'm glad you have a flashlight. And so he follows the beam of light, he gets to the light switch, he takes kind of a deep sigh, and he flips the light switch on. Now he's sobbing as he's telling me the dream. And he says the light is better than the darkness like he didn't know this to be the case. And when he told me that dream, it just changed my life forever. And I've never looked back. And, and it was a little bit like the earlier part about, you know, what is eternally replenishing? And how do you not deplete? And how do you make sure it's not about you? And, uh, and so then it became, I, I was content to own a flashlight and maybe know where to aim it. But I, but I knew what I had been doing. I was trying to turn the light switch on for people. And that you can't do it, and it's crazy making. So uh, that was kind of a big moment that was kind of unlike anything in my life where all of a sudden things changed in an instant. And I've never been close to that again, where I've, you know, wanted to fix, you know. And, and rescue and save and, and, uh, and I'm grateful for that moment, but it, it, it uh, saved me from myself. Thank you. I know that you, like me, probably have a lot of questions you wanna ask these people. And the good news is we're about to move outside and you can corner them. <laughs> We also have two other um, people we profiled with us today, and you can try to find them too, Patrice Coulors and Julie Coyne. And hopefully they will stay, with, everyone will stay with us as we go out for some refreshments and music, and we can continue these conversations. Before letting everyone go, um, I have the joyful task of thanking everyone, especially our curators, Noel and Magdalena Rojo, the CRCC staff, especially Megan Suisse and Heba Farag, who oversaw and guided everything from the journalism to this exhibition with calm, patience, and loving kindness. You are my spiritual exemplars. <laughs> I also want to thank Jim Yoder and his staff, <laughs> Sue Boritz of Marcom, Margie Denton for the gorgeous graphic design, and Daniela Hinch, the video, the video editor. Feel free to walk through ex the exhibit, enjoy the QR codes, which are the multimedia elements, and join us outside for the music of the Ron McCurdy Jazz Quartet. And thank you all for coming, and thank you all for speaking. <laughs>